We really can't top that introduction. I have so far. I'm going to go away. No, it's all right. You know, we'll be okay? Yeah. We'll yeah. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Nick Jacinto. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at William Jewell College, also a professor of practice and our new cybersecurity major, which we're launching this fall. Uh, it is a pleasure, honor to be able to have uh, some of my friends and colleagues from, from the industry here to talk to you today about insider threat. I, you can see my background up there. I don't need to get into it too much, but we also have some really impressive folks here as well. So I'll start first with Josh Jaffe. He's the current CISO at Scout Motors, uh, which is an EV startup under Volkswagen. Uh, 20 plus year career in government, private sector, um, non nonprofit work as well. Uh, so you, you can take all that in on the slide as well. Dr. Stacy Thayer is with us. She is a PhD in cyber psychology. She is currently the chief strategy officer at Hilltop Technologies, which is a new cyber startup that was just launched at William Jewell College for students to have opportunities in our degree programs to work in a real cyber startup. And she's a professor of cyber psychology at William Jewell as well. Next we have Willis McDonald, uh, who does own his own company. <coughs> he is also uh, working inside or threat issues at Chainalysis, which is one of the more, the more premier preeminent uh, blockchain intelligence companies in the world. And then we have Gall Sponsor, who is the uh, owner, founder of Security Outliers and has done cybersecurity work uh, for 20 plus years in Fortune 50, higher education, nonprofit, uh, all the things, right? All the things. Okay, so I'm really excited to have their expertise here. And so drawing on my own experience working insider threat events at Uber and Tesla and other companies, also coming from my background as a CIA operations officer, where it was my job to break into other entities, foreign adversaries, and steal their secrets, uh, I take a, a bit of a mentality or an approach of thinking about how the bad guys think, because I was the bad guy to our adversaries. And so my approach to insider threat has really been to think about vulnerabilities and gaps and problems and challenges. And as a former operations officer, it was my job to identify individuals with access to foreign intelligence and identify things that were bothering them about their jobs or their lives, things that I could use to develop a relationship with them and get them to the point where using either that disgruntlement or that frustration or that ideological belief would get them to the point of being willing to share classified secrets with me as a representative of the U.S. government. And so what that taught me was that it's not just governments that have these types of problems and things to protect, but it's also, this is a people issue. An insider threat is just as much about protecting uh, our our technical boundaries and perimeters with good tech firewalls and all kinds of uh, vulnerability management. But it's also a people-centric challenge. And so we've assembled this panel today to talk about that people aspect of insider threat and insider trust. So I'm going to start with Dr. Thayer and ask, um, so fundamentally, right, why do employees become this drunkard and really to the point where they are willing to engage in an, in an act of incident that would be harmful to the company. And how do you spot that perhaps in time to prevent that from becoming a security tool? I think there's a, a couple of things. Um, can, can you hear me okay? So from the base, I mean, first off, is good hiring practices. And I, I because I, I do strongly believe it is a people issue. So a lot of people say to me, oh, I hire for the person and the culture, not just the technical capabilities. And I know that's hard because you have technical needs, but to what degree is that, are those technical needs where you're willing to compromise to hire somebody that you know might have a bit of a chip on their shoulder, or you know might have the potential to not get along with your team. And so that's from just kind of the get-go. Now, for, if you've already hired these people and they come in and they're happy and they're, they're there, and what starts to happen is 
lines have been divided and they experience, they, they stop experience with psychological safety and they don't feel valued. I think the scariest thing is somebody who does not feel they have a voice, but they have something very loud to say. And if they are ignored and they start to feel small, they start to feel like they can't matter. A lot of times that retaliation comes out sideways. Like when you're unhappy, it comes out one way or another. So you're a human here talking about those emotions. And they can be typical responses like, oops, I snapped at my partner or a friend, or, you know, I'm, I'm eating my emotions. You <laughs> my, my talk this morning, right? And if it builds up over time where enough resentment can build up, the company doesn't care about me. I don't care about them. They hurt me. I'll hurt them. And depending on the person, it can become very retaliatory. And I think that's really where things start to happen is when somebody feels like they're not valued, heard, or cared for, they're going to return that. I think that's, uh, that's great insight. And it speaks to a, a recent sort of situation, and we use the Cash App example. Um, where their lack of coherent sort of uh, documented termination policy led a former employee who was upset or disgruntled about being uh, dismissed from the company uh, to download and leak information after they had already exited the company because they didn't have the appropriate controls in place to prevent a former employee from accessing systems. Um, that led to a class action lawsuit, which cost the company $15 million uh, and 8.2 million people's financial information was exposed in the process of that. So I'm going to ask Josh this question. Um, how do you assess the level of technical safeguards that you should employ? And how do you keep those tools from getting to the point where it's triggering employees with concerns about privacy or trust? Yeah, awesome. It's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that's most important is to sort of think about it and think about this issue from the perspective of um, not necessarily maybe leadership or authority or accountability for the control structure, but just think of that from like the perspective of how do you interpret when there's controls or boundaries, but around some aspect of your life, something you care about? Do you think about that as somebody who's sort of there's guardrails on the side of the road. Intention. There's lines in the middle of the road. The intention is sort of help me keep me in a place where I'm more likely to be safe and not likely to become victim of some other thing, some some bad accident. Or do you think about it? Somebody's like, they don't trust me. They don't trust me. Well, they might have tried. I don't put these lines or show me where I should be driving. Right. Silly example, but you sort of get the notion that at the end of the day, there's sort of boundaries that are. Put around of almost everything we do, we sort of naturally accept that. Well, sometimes it feels um, it feels evasive, right? It feels like somebody's they're ins inserting themselves, their opinions, their values, their judgments somewhere into your life. And you know, I, I'm a mature, responsible adult. I have my own value system. I can make those own judgment, those judgments for myself. But I think one of the things that's important to do from the perspective of an organization is to make sure that. Like if you're in the position of a CISO or a technology leader where you're responsible for the technology controls you're putting in place in a company, is to make sure that those are consistent with the company's values. So at the end of the day, you shouldn't have values that say, you know, we, we trust our employees, we empower their work, but we're going to spy on you, we're going we're gonna to be managing a whole range of controls that are going to be reporting back everything you do everywhere you go, every pilot you access. Should, shouldn't do that unless you've established sort of a, a predicate for that, which explains to the organization why those things are mutually reinforcing or valuable or important for this sort of commitment to trust that, that you have with your employees. So one of the ways we talk about this, I, I, work, I work for a car company. It's a division of Volkswagen. It's uh, we're, we're remaking a series of uh, old, old, some of you might remember the old International Harvester Scout for making a series of old trucks as um, as as new modern electric vehicles. The most important thing we have right now is about to, and most secret thing we have right now is about to be, in a couple of months, the most public thing we have. It's what are cars and trucks we're going to launch them with. Right now, nobody knows what they look like. As soon as we launch them, everyone's going to know what they look like. Right. But, but right now, that's the most sensitive thing we have. So, we've got a whole bunch of designers, most of our team, most of our engineers, they're building the concept for the stock. They're working on that every day. We're trusting them. We're empowering them with the most valuable asset we have in this company. 
but we're also not just empowering the one person who might be having a conversation with one-to-one -one about why it's important, but we're in an ecosystem, a community where all of their hard work, their life's work, the thing they're pouring their time, their energy, their 12 hour days into is also the same thing they have to trust somebody else in the organization because they're working on it too. And they're working with contractors, third parties, consultants, there's people who are coming in and cleaning the building, they're going to have to walk by and see stuff maybe on someone's monitor or screen. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we are sort of mutually empowering each other, trusting each other to work on. And that's a thing that has tremendous value to our organization. So you build this notion of I'm empowering you to do this work. I'm trusting you with the most sensitive, the most important stuff you can hear in a position to trust. And also because we all have to trust each other, there's going to be a culture of mutual accountability, similar to the speed limits and the guardrails that we're talking about. The technology, to answer your question, it reinforces those norms, those values. It doesn't oppose them, right? So the idea is technology should be aligned with the values. And those values should probably be consistent with the corporate values. They should be part of the way that you think about it. The way you're bringing the people and the way that you're working. Sure. And it's also, I think, it's highlighted communication and expectation management are really important so that employees understand, uh, your colleagues understand why we have the we have there for protection. Um, and, and so I, I think that's. I think that's a correct approach. It makes a lot of sense to me. I, so when I look at the statistics, and Verizon puts out a really good report annually on insider threat. So from comparing their 2023 report back to 2018, 53% of organizations had 21 to 40 insider threat incidents a year. Now in 2023, that's up to 71%. So something is not really working we're working well the way that maybe it should be. So I ask all, um, what's the ideal type of structure and governance for an insider threat program from your experience? The first thing to know is that uh, we have amazing, uh, almost inspiring slash verified technical capabilities to see what's going on out there on the laptop, or we have your websites to talk to, the data access you have when you talk to those websites or internal servers, all that stuff. Uh, some companies tend to board very intrusive things like full screen recording, keystroke logging. And obviously those are generally above and beyond the normal monitoring. Uh, it's considered to be a little bit intrusive, but the transparency and understanding it has to make sense in terms of, is this something that we want to do? Do we want to collect this data? Uh, and how does it comport to which type of risk is involved? Are they working on intellectual property or super sensitive projects? Or are they something, someone that is uh, managing the intellectual uh, So th there's levels of risk there. But the main thing is, with all the technology that we have, to be able to create a, uh, an evidence uh, trail to support a legal, moral investigation, we have to make sure that we do have legal law investigations and that the people that are uh, creating these data trails are accessing them in a way that makes sense, that you could justify to the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and also to opposing counsel and a jury. Because if someone is getting investigated with this massive trove of data that has been compiled on their data activities as a worker, but it appears to be that you're picking on them for some reason and kind of creating a case that you're hanging on them because you just want to get rid of them because they don't do things that they don't want to do and really shouldn't be doing as an employee, then that's going to be uh, something that comes back to bite you. Uh, your reputation in the community, your reputation um, as a company in, in the market. So we want to have the general counsel involved. We want to have HR involved. In some cases, law enforcement, if, it's, if, it, if there's a crime involved, certainly if there's child pornography, that's a compromise. We might really want to even touch that stuff and have to call it. Law enforcement is probably one of the worst ones. But we really have to understand the time to create procedures and uh, policies and relevant instrumentation and access to the data trail that you create with that instrumentation is not when someone is discovered to have done things or is uh, leaking secrets but beforehand, so do a tabletop, what would this look like, grab something from the news, and understand that there's a layer eight and governance controls involved that are as important, maybe more so, 
then the technical evidence for which you can uh, create you know, all the interpretation as possible. So there, there's some good stories I'll share later, but uh, that, that's, I think, a big part of it. It's not a technical issue. Yes, yes, real quickly to follow up on that, the thing that I hate the most, that always scares me the most, wherever I am in, in my career as a, as a security leader, is when I get some request that makes all the sense in the world, it, can you look into this cursor, this thing, this happened, and there's no grounding in procedures or in, in a governance structure for how we're allowed to do that. So we've got tools, we can do it, we have procedures for how we investigate outside in bad guy activities. Somebody did something, they're accused of something internally in the company, somebody walked by and something suspicious, and they go ask one of my people, hey, can you look into this for me? All of a sudden, we're sort of changing that internal contract in the organization for what our team's responsible, what we're accountable for, and maybe somebody, maybe it does go somewhere, maybe someone gets called as a witness, and then all of a sudden you're in the situation where where's the, where's the procedure, where's the governance structure that justifies you keeping that action, and people who have only the best intentions end up finding themselves stuck between two really hard sleepers here. Is that right? I mean, it's absolutely the time to do to build those procedures and those government structures as what we need. And this is it's kind of like the corporate equivalent of, you know, hey, can you hack my exit instead of Facebook? Right? It's like, you don't want to be that, just because you can, doesn't necessarily mean you should, and it's legal and moral, right? So there, there's technology and there's people and there's a process. And the process is really where I think the, the moral and legal issues come in the most. Because everybody can get all the tech they want, basically corporate spyware, Google, uh, Microsoft purview for a dealership, for example. So enterprise spyware for deploying around the country, around your network. Uh, and you'll see a lot of things you probably don't want to see about your employees, and we certainly don't want to use them. So even turning on those features usually requires some nexus of, okay, they've reached a threshold of evidence that implies there's either malice or they're being exploited by third party, uh, and we need to gather some evidence to figure out what's actually going on here. Please use those tools responsibly, appropriately, and with the uh, approval of your uh, information security. <laughs> Just that, that's what you also meant to say. <laughs> I guess one less counts. Yes, it counts. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I'll throw a little bit more more insight here because these, um, these incidents, despite the amount of technical security controls we have and policies and whatever, when it comes to insider threat, they're among the more difficult issues uh, or incidents to investigate. On average, it's 91 days for a company to identify insider threat activity going on within its own walls or firewalls. That's crazy if you think about what if you had someone like Sandworm inside your, inside your network for three months, what could they possibly do? Um, you have an insider threat working for three months against you in some form or fashion, that's uh, that's pretty troubling. And it's why typically these events lead to such uh, high costs for companies. $16.5 million on average per incident when they occur. So I'm going to ask Willis, who has had a lot of experience forensically <laughs> investigating these types of things, um, you know, going back to working at FBI and and the fort and uh, you know, chain analysis and Mesos, other places, you've seen a lot of these types of things, right? Despite a lot of security controls. So, um, how often, in your experience, do insider threat issues that you investigate actually tie to a malicious act? And um, what are the commonalities that you see in the type of persona, personality, or individual? that typically is engaged in malicious action. Yeah, so I would say uh, about somewhere around 75% of the investigations I do uh, tend to lean towards uh, someone who's actually doing something malicious. They're doing something on purpose, they have a reason behind it, they have uh, some sort of grudge. The other 25% are misunderstanding. Someone did something wrong, they leaked information, they didn't know that they were actually leaking information, and that's where some of these other tools that are a little bit more intrusive come in to help them make those decisions. Um, but when you're looking at someone who is who has malicious intent, they know what they're doing, they are very disgruntled, very angry with the company, for 
any number of reasons, but primarily it comes down to um, issues that started out small. Um, maybe at some point they got passed over for a promotion because for some reason the company wasn't doing this well. But to them, that was personal. It wasn't that uh, the company just wasn't doing well and they couldn't afford that promotion. Um, and, and these are things that come up in HR, these are things that come up to managers, um, other employees. And so those types of issues tend to slow down and they become, you know, from being passed over for a promotion, it becomes, okay, well, I'm not going to show up for team meetings. Um, I, well, you talked to me a bit earlier about, I'm not going to turn on my camera anymore, even though I've always been doing this. Um, and these sort, sort of mild, passive aggressive issues come up. Um, and so, what usually breaks down and where these uh, tend to snowball into large incidents and insider where they actually make the choice to do something malicious is. Uh, where things break down, just communication between the employee, between their manager, and between everyone involved. So we're talking HR, we've got silos between HR and security, we've got silos between uh, security and maybe physical security. Uh, and, and a lot of times those communication channels take the most time in the investigation to go back and Bring, uh, bring down some of the silos, get all the information in order to figure out, yeah, this was malicious and we should have seen this coming, but we didn't because nobody was talking to each other. Um, but those sort of activities are things that come up, come up very come up as a behavior, um, vocalized an issue at some point and don't like their opinion didn't matter. Whereas if someone talked about it and addressed it um, and made them feel valued, this would never have snowballed into an issue. Yeah, and so what Willis is talking about is something if you're, I would urge you to research this term called the critical path or the critical pathway. Um, Carnegie Mellon does a lot of good work on insider threat and they talk about this in their organizations. And Really, this gets a, a lot into Dr. Bayer's wheelhouse because the critical pathway he's talking about is where an individual has those types of, um, there's just something going on in their environment, either a personal life, financial situation, it could be a mental health issue, it could be a relationship issue that just kind of leads them predisposed to be frustrated by things that go on and they sort of internalize that, like he said, taking personally, which is correct. And as they move down that pathway, there are usually indicators as willis even gave us some examples of not showing up to meetings or not having their camera on those are things that as colleagues not even as managers or supervisors just as colleagues to recognize our coworkers and say hey you doing okay research has shown that that question asked at the right time of the person who needs that type of outreach can actually stop someone from moving down the critical pathway. And it's just sort of like being a good colleague or a good human and, and caring enough to say, you know, something doesn't seem right. I mean, are you doing all right? Is there anything I can do to help you? Because uh, companies typically have a lot of resources, but it's really hard for that person sometimes to see the forest through the trees and realize that maybe they need to reach out for some employee assistance. And, and usually those are there for them. So those, I, those sort of indicators are observable. But in the critical pathway, you get to a point of a triggering event, and that triggering event is usually what like, sort of sets off that explosion, and that's where you actually see the activity. And we know statistically that most employees will exfiltrate uh, the most information out of a company within the last two weeks of their employment. So typically, they make up their mind to do this, and it's in that last two weeks where they actually do something that, uh, that is significant. So I think my, my well, I'll actually touch on something that Gall said, which is, <coughs> you know, companies that implement insider threat working groups are the companies that recognize those silos have to be broken down and you have to do it before the incidents occur. 
Because chances are they've actually already occurred, you just didn't even know it until you set up a formalized program and structure to deal with that. And insiders start working groups bring in experts from HR and legal, as you mentioned, um, security, infosec, physical security. There's a number of different participants. Bringing those groups together is how you get ahead of these challenges. And you also talk about not just how to handle an incident, but how to prevent incidents. What does employee training look like? What does culture development look like? What does engagement look like? How do we coach our leadership on fostering a good culture? So I'm going to throw this over to Dr. Thayer, right? Like, what, what, is, what does a, a good culture look like in order to optimize a company's ability to get the most out of its employees without leading to these situations? Well, so first off, what I, I always encourage them to do is, what is the path right now? Not every manager is a people person, right? Or feels comfortable saying, hey, are you doing okay? And we don't want to create a culture of mistrust with our peers. Like, uh, okay, well, Josh was having a little shady yesterday. I think, uh, you know, maybe you want to talk to him. Like, we just, it just doesn't, we don't want to get into and start suspicious of each other. But you do you want to think, okay, if somebody was unhappy, if somebody did have to, you know, vent, express themselves, where would they go to do it? Is it the water cooler? Ooh, that's, that's a slippery slope. Is HR available? And I'm, I'm a big I know it was, there's HR is complicated, and a lot of times they're there for the company and to protect the company, and not everybody has that person that's actually there that goes around and um, uses the, the measuring stick to you know, look at the culture. But that role is, or whoever that person is, whether they, you know, that's what they were hired for or not. Who, if somebody was unhappy, where would they go? Do you have a kind of relationship with your staff that you're the person? You're, do you have that open door policy? And if you may think you have that open door policy, confirm it. You should be, you should know if you're managing somebody, you should know or at least have some kind of gauge on right, their patterns of behavior. We spend so much time analyzing right, security trends and, and what's going on in the data. People are data too, and people are predictable. They can be profiled. You know, if, if somebody who's previously been outgoing and Wilson is very quiet, or they've come to you many times complaining about something and it's ignored, just people want to be seen. I think people inherently understand that, okay, the problems can't always be solved, right? So my talk somewhere is talking about like what you can control and can't control. So whether you know how much of your budget you have to work with may be hard to control. But if you can explain, have that transparency of, okay, team, this is what we're working with. Uh, it's psychological safety, level of engagement, and what is the path to, to get to those? So that somebody does not feel unheard or unvalued or where they're just left with really the only recourse being to, as I said earlier, retaliate. So I always encourage managers who you know, think that the only thing that matters are the technical skills and I can work around personalities. Can you? <laughs> shouldn't you is actually the better question. Maybe you can, but should you? Because people feed off each other. Uh, and... You want to create that culture of trust, and if you aren't giving trust, are you communicating a lack of trust and a lack of empowerment? So I, the more awareness that you have of yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, the team around you, and your resources. So if you're, okay, I have an open door policy, but if someone comes to me and they're really mad, I don't, I don't know what to do. That's, that's not my emotional wheelhouse. Don't try to stretch beyond what you're comfortable with. You don't have to be the counselor or somebody has a family problem that they're dealing with, but don't just leave them feeling un like they're not heard or they don't matter. Somebody say comes to you and says, I'm going through a divorce, I need more money to take care of my kids, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what do I do? Would you know what to do? And if the answer is, you know, as a manager, I wouldn't know what to do, find the answer. Resources, even if you have just the resources of, you know, okay, you see, here's your hotline to call. Not quite that, but how can you make people feel valued? Yeah, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna take what what you just articulated and and ask Josh this because you know you've had to implement security policies and programs before, and you sort of talked about <laughs> these technical guardrails. You have to be open and communicative about it so everybody understands. But there's 
Like I think organizations sometimes get into a space of their their uh, implementing security more with fear uh, and the repercussions of bad actions and like the you know challenge. <laughs> Employees don't have the freedom to fail, essentially, right? Um, and it creates pressure not just to, you know, from maliciousness, but also just I can't make a mistake. Do you, how do you think organizations need to approach this fear versus trust boundary? Yeah. So ideally, you build a culture where people are afraid of failing, and they're not afraid of the controls. There might be things that fear is a real emotion. There's going to be things you're going to be fearful of. And why do and certainly in your professional life? Um, spiders, spiders, snakes, bears, hackers, hackers, um, no, but the trust much more powerful motivator. I think if you're motivating people on the basis of fear, you're never going to have as effective an effect on the program. Nothing, no matter how effective your controls are, they're not going to be as effective as strong culture. Truth is, you need both, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you can't. It would be naive to think you could have a security program based entirely on trust and trans transparency. But I think some of the things you do to enhance those are that you are honestly transparent with people about what you can tell them, about what you're doing, why you're doing it, why we have these controls, what they're intended for. They're not intended because we distrust our employees and are looking for the worst 10% to 10% were the lowest performers or the worst global that they keep moving them out of the company, they're there to protect you and your work and your intellectual property, your personal information. They're also, to the degree that possible, you align that with a sense of accountability. You show the ability to use of, you can take a little bit behind the curtain, show them how you use that, right? Not so much compromising any actual investigation than any actual people's stories, but demystify, right? Because not everyone's going to go in to draw the right inferences initially. When you do that, I think you actually, when you have the trust, you can do much more what could potentially be invasive things, technically. And <coughs> instead of having the consequence of people distrusting you, it's actually going to deepen their their sense of trust because you're doing more and you're taking them behind the curtain, show them all, trusting them, I mean, like how it works, and making them a part of it. If they see themselves in it, if they see themselves in it, they trust it more. I think it's actually... Even more important now, like in this sort of post COVID work environment that we're in, is we talk a lot about like the ways people get affirmation or get value from their work. But you used to run into people all the time in the hall, and someone would say, Hey, I, I love that thing you did, or I saw that that was really cool, or that was a very talk you gave, or you know, they might ask you a question and say, like, You know, what are you working on? And you might tell them, That's great, that's really exciting. Now we kind of get all of that affirmation and that value and like, did I get a release or not? Did I get promoted or not? Or did my project pass project with you, stage gates, whatever, or not? And all those other little sort of affirmational things, those get lost. Those are gone. Those don't really happen unless you make space for them. It's similarly like things that were obvious to us in terms of like corporate values, just the way we engage with each other, the respect we show each other, when we look someone in the eye or your boss and they just walk into your office and say, hey, what's going on today? How is it working? Someone put in a team meeting and just say, hey, you look a little down today. Like, what's up? How can I help? Those things that used to happen just naturally. And now they don't happen naturally. You have to kind of force them. You have to say, these are my values. <laughs> these are the values on our team. You have to say them out loud or maybe write them down. You, you have to be constantly affirm, right? Yeah. You, you got to look for a way, almost a way that sounds silly. It's like, hey, I like that thing you did. Send, right? But, Seems kind of awkward, but it makes it necessary to make up for some of the things that were otherwise missing. And if you don't, then you end up, I think, in a situation where the amount of opportunities you have for sort of affirmation for trust building, those are really reduced. And very easy for people to draw a conclusion that my work's not valued, I'm not valued. If I'm not valued, then you want to be a, you don't have to be a narcissist to be like, Maybe I shouldn't work this hard. Maybe this is why I'm not there. Maybe I'll take it when I go. So there's, there's real changes happening, but I think sometimes we're not really aware of it. But then there's some other things that make it different. Yeah, I just want to you know, reinforce that of for your peers, for your managers, 
was the last time, if, if you believe it, by the way, but um, you know, you told your manager, hey, thanks, you know, I appreciate you, or I'm here, I appreciate what you did, or recognition. I think sometimes we think it, but we don't necessarily say it, or to your point, there's a, a canned HR Slack channel of recognition, you put through some software, and it shows up in front of everybody, and it's always like the same two people that are posting in it, and it doesn't feel as natural as it did as you're walking down the hallway and, and saying, like, hey, by the way, you know, thanks for that, I really appreciate it, and I'm a huge fan of remote work, I actually think it makes people more productive and independent, but we do have to, to make sure that people aren't on an island where they don't feel valid. <laughs> uh, speak up a little bit more, uh, but in other words, if, you know, if you think it, if you if you feel it, tell the person. I mean, you maybe feel shy, you may feel awkward. Okay, this is completely out of left field, but more often than not, you're actually creating that healthy culture because there, by nature, there's going to be a toxicity factor to it, and you're helping combat that with positivity. There's my sunshine and rainbow. For you, but uh, I think I'll use that. Well, it's in personal skills, right? Yes. And and utilizing those effectively, and also just genuinely showing care and concern. I've it, this has been hammered in to, to my sort of journey is in leadership over and over is not to underestimate the value of a handwritten note to someone, which is really crazy. You think it's so simple, uh, and it just shows one you took the time to do it. You were intentional. You um, and, and you were specific about something. I say, hey, great job, appreciate you, have a nice day. But hey, thank you for that thing you did. Uh, being very specific and intentional, uh, I found it's actually gone a long way to, uh, to demonstrate appreciation to folks. So we, we are spending a lot of time talking about kind of that culture, which is exactly what we want to do here. I think we also, to do justice to this entire topic, have to recognize that a lot of challenges from an insider threat perspective are also not malicious. They're unwitting or they're mistakes. And so, uh, Gaul, how, like, what's the optimized sort of way from a, a training and awareness perspective to, uh, to help us think through ways to prevent those types of things? Um, so everybody should know that you, if you have a position inside of a firm or an agency or a profit, a school, whatever it is, you have access to things that people outside that organization don't have. And they want what you have. And they want what you have directly or they want what you have indirectly. So if you have the ability to move a lot of bits, maybe you're an admin of some technical platform back end, certainly a domain controller or person who's in charge of those things, domain admin, that's the end goal of a lot of apps. And interestingly, a lot of the things that look like insider threat, once they start living off the land and get out of the malware environment, are just using abusing, abusing credentials that belong to a powerful privileged insider. Similarly, if you're moving a lot of money, if you are someone who works for accounts payable and you get an email saying, hey, my payee information changed to this new bank account, here's an invoice that you owe me from this month. So understand what is it that you have access to directly and indirectly because of your passwords or whatever is sitting on your computer and your brain understanding and processes, they can put together via some analysis a very powerful way to get at the end game, which is what they want. On data, they want money, they want to lock up your systems, which then force us to give them more money, the ransomware, et cetera. So we need to understand what is my position here and why would someone be interested in me or, or the role that I represent to be able to get to some impact on the company. And uh, you know, earlier today we talked about deep fakes, almost understanding how people come at you, phishing, cash, email approaches in person. They're a little bit out of fashion with everybody's on the tubes all the time, but that still happens. Right. You're an expert at eliciting information in person. Uh, there are people who really know how to do that. Are you being spotted on SAS? If someone asks you information, you will never see that person again. But they're going to call someone who will come and get your stuff because you've been put on a target list. So understand what the whole chain of events and the life cycle of, of, of targeting you as a part of a larger chain of events. And be able to understand that and be able to, to know if you're a CISO of an organization or you're in charge of a lot of people who move a lot of money and do a lot of bits, make sure that they know how they're going to get, who's going to come at them and who to report to, what elements of information should they include in a report like that so that someone on the back end is doing the analysis of, oh, you've been spotted in the SAS. 
someone's going to come after you probably in this way because of X, Y, and Z information that you have access to. I think people really need to understand, as you mentioned earlier, people are in a position of trust, even if they don't necessarily know that I'm not some big shot at this company, but they have access to information or access to a process that would unlock a lot of other information downstream. So moving bits, moving money, uh, be able to make statements on behalf of a public company, is the person in charge of releasing uh, SEC facing information for quarterly reports. Before that happens, before it's time for that quarterly report, that's a very secret market moving information. People are not looking for that information. It's like people want the images of their cars before it gets publicized. It's the flip side of building your trusting public right? I trust you, good. I feel good. Someone trusts me. Now you are in a position of trust, right? In that position of trust, just like a CFO, just like a general counsel, anybody else in the organization. Now that comes with responsibilities too. And those responsibilities come with procedures, controls, governments, obligations, tools that I try to ensure that that position of trust is in because of other people who are part of us with a trust community. And don't delay reporting, even if you think you're going to get in trouble. I've been in a lot of organizations where getting compromised is accepted because we're all being targeted for whatever reason, usually money or data or data with money together, but not reporting that you are overtly compromised in some way or have been approached and uh, were asked for cooperation, that could be looked at as very suspicious and very um, on, on the borderline of malicious intent. Um, so you need to report that stuff very quickly to the right people so they can put the puzzle pieces together and figure out where, what phase are we in, who's, who's coming after us. One of the companies that I worked for in the past would be had a lot of uh, intellectual property and scientists and, and things that where people were traveling overseas quite a bit. We had to put together a training to help them understand what what a potential approach would look like that could compromise them. So we, we titled the training, no, you're not that attractive. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll add one more thing to, um, yeah, like, I think we can actually mention this while we were talking earlier, but the other thing is also labeling your data so that when it comes time to realize what's moving out of your environment, uh, that you've already labeled it and you know what's the most important thing and you know what I don't really need to look at or worry about before it's the time when you're in a crunch and you do have reporting requirements and you start missing things or you start wasting your time looking at data that nobody, you know, it's public data or nobody cares about. Um, because a lot of times, maybe your investigator is a no exactly what's important to you. Um, and so if it's labeled, it makes it very easy to start putting things together as to what happened, what failed, uh, as well as, you know, possibly who's responsible. It's not a reinforce of that notion too, right? Like if you have a tool that, you know, use the Microsoft E5 suite or you have something else you're using for classifying, the last thing you have to do before you close or save there is you have to you have to remind yourself, oh, this is confidential. I had a press confidential, so I can save it. I have to classify it so I can actually close it. So, you, well, the last thing you remember was this was a confidential document. This was a confidential file. This is confidential ID. This belongs to the company. But it's, I'm in a position of trust. I'm this confidential document. And participated in a lot of internal investigations where the company was really upset that something was taken. And uh, one of the first things the FBI will ask you when you report the uh, the incident is, well, what information security controls did you have around the information? If you as a company didn't invest enough to protect the information, then why would anybody have a reasonable expectation that that information was super important or confidential? So it really does have to start with you defining what's important first before you can even expect to get help in the event that something does go out the door. Um, We've covered a lot of really good insights and information. I appreciate everybody up here so much. Uh, we want to have some opportunity and time for anyone to ask questions because you've got some you've got some high horsepower up here and a lot of great experience. So we'd love for you to take uh, take the opportunity if you have questions. Sir, what what's your definition of whistleblower? Is that still an insider threat? Uh, that's that's a great question, and so. We all may have some thoughts on this, but I can tell you I have 
I've investigated a lot of intellectual property or just confidential sensitive information and incidents where that was passed to reporters, where that was passed and, and it was publicized. And we had to investigate who that individual was to, to identify them because we didn't necessarily know. And when you catch them or identify them, it's, well, I'm a whistleblower because I'm bringing to light something that, you know, was, was, uh, was some sort of a, a cover up or an unsaving business practice or what have you. I always had a real hard time assessing or believing that that person fed the, fed the definition of a whistleblower. Um, because when we did the investigation, we tended to uncover those same psychological types of elements going on where there was narcissism, there was uh, lack of self awareness, there was. Um, um, time and time again being told that they were getting out of their lane, that they, uh, where they were raising concerns, that they didn't feel were being responded, you know, that didn't, didn't meet the level of response that they believed that they should get. And so they ended up taking matters into their own hands. If you're going to leak information uh, to a reporter and try to hide yourself, you're not a whistleblower. So I look at more traditionally, but at least my, my definition would be someone who reports something to the legal entity, the proper legal entity, um, who has the authority over those issues. So if it's the SEC or the FBI or what have you, those are the individuals who meet that threshold in my opinion because they're willing to say, I, I, I am publicly or, you know, at least directly, non-anonymously taking this to the right authority because I believe that something wrong has occurred. And those people should be protected, right? That's what gives people whistleblower protection. You don't, you're not afforded that when you leak information to a reporter and you try to cover your tracks. That to me is, a, that's criminal. So I'm not a lawyer, so don't take any of this in legal. And neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a good question, but I, I think, I mean, foundationally, the person doing the, the whistleblowing has to have a bona fide expectation that the thing that they're blowing the whistle about is in violation of the law. And if they do, then, you know, there should be protections that are affordable. That there's totally different uh, paths for someone who thinks maybe they own the intellectual property for this thing. Maybe they built it. Doesn't really belong to the company. You can sue the company for that, right? But you can't just take it, uh, especially if, if there's not a clear expectation or uh, judgment about the ownership. So it's a great question to ask a real lawyer now, just somebody who's sitting on a stage like this. But I, I think, you know, you do foundationally have their bona fide expectation, but the thing that you're blowing the whistle about, by the Thank you. So now that we are working more and more from home, what's your advice, suggestion on your keeping your work stuff and personal stuff, you know? Oh, I'm working from my work laptop, maybe I'll put it, you know. I think we have to acknowledge the flexibility that comes with that, right? That people are at home, they're going to do some home stuff, right? But clearly defining what's okay on the work device is really important. You do that through policies and educational training. But if somebody's working from home, I kind of expect that they're not going to may not respond with Slack immediately because maybe they. You know, they got up there to go pick up their, their child from school or something, right? I just think you have to have that. You have to set your own expectations as an organization or manager. Hopefully dependent and role dependent too. I mean, you, you might be fine with somebody checking the status of an Amazon delivery. You might be fine with them doing it from their, from their work computer. You probably are fine with them doing it from the work computer if they're using a browser that is logged in with their admin credential, right? At that point, you're exposing that credential to a range of other websites and things. You got to be pretty clear about how you want to manage those expectations based on roles. You're like uh, last pass got raised because the yep. admin team yep. was locked up with some things like, what do you do? I think people will do that. Yeah. Well, and things about educating you. So, I mean, like, we've all, I'm sure, taken the security interviews <coughs> with the bad, and I li literally need bad actors this time. Um, but <laughs> you launch it on YouTube or whatever at 2.0 speed to get through it and everything. That's great. That tells you, you know, don't say hello, I leave my laptop open, right? We still do that all the time. But, you know, I mean, I've been in, in security for a long time, but I'm not technical, but I still have to kind of mark through, like, 
Oh, so wait a minute. So if I'm logged into, you know, say, like the Google browser and I have my account and my work account, or, or is it, can they look at Like, I don't, I don't know. And I become very aware of, okay, um, you know, I had this conversation about getting like a work laptop. What if I take all my stuff and I put it on my work laptop? What if I take all my work stuff and put it on my home laptop? Is that the same thing? Like, you know, and, and I think what's really great is, is when as security professionals, there's that. Um, kindness of things. That's what it feels like to me. To be able to really kind of ex explain it, like, here's why. And so that becomes twofold because it helps the organization have the psychological safety to ask the questions that they feel dumb asking. Technical date gatekeeping is real. And when you have asked somebody to reset your password 30 times because you can't remember it, and then you want to ask something like really technical, it's, it's people are scared to do it. But it's the why that helps. And so I think when we do security training, we kind of dumb it down and do and know and we have to. But at that advanced level, we're not even giving people the education to understand what it means, like why they would do that like, and, and what it looks like, what it's supposed to look like. We don't set those expectations and communicate it. And so to the point we, you know, we were saying earlier, it's like, you know, if you say, say one of my mottos in life is like, don't attribute to malice, what you can attribute to stupidity. Like, <laughs> Just one of those things, like people stumble into it because they don't know any better and it's damaging. I, I don't know if there are any parents in, in the room that can sort of relate to when, you know, if your child wants to, you know, sit in the front seat of the car and you're like, no, uh, no, you sit in the back. Well, why? Because like, I told you to. I'm your parent. That's why. Well, that, that really doesn't work. That gets them frustrated, and it sort of creates, you know, some tension. But if I take five seconds to explain, uh, because the, the government says that if you're sitting in the front, uh, they're going to arrest me and take me to jail. <laughs> and if your child says, cool, <laughs> a other issue to address. But the, the point is, sometimes if I just took five seconds to explain the why, I wouldn't have to deal with the frustration of... of the insubordination of my child in that moment. I'm not comparing, trying to compare employees to, to children. What I'm saying is we sometimes, we, we want something done and we ask for it to be done or we tell somebody to get it done. And if we forget task, purpose, deadline, we're setting ourselves and the, and the other person up for failure because they're not going to meet expectations because you haven't first couched the expectations properly. So just remembering those three things when you ask for something, is, is really important to actually ensuring the entire process goes much smoother. <laughs> Sir? We're just starting the security program and we're revamping slash starting the security program at our company. In your opinion, what would be the best way to kind of give that out to the end users and the security holders of all? Okay, so the question is revamping a security program. What's the best way to roll that out? Communicate? Well, communicate, get uh, kind of, I guess, the uh, level of uh, incentives from end user to uh, get sex, kind of like the whole company line. Mm -hmm. um, well, depending on the size of the organization, there's lots of different ways that people want. So you need to think, okay, how do people do Visually, auditorily, experientially. So in an ideal world, so if I can even wave my magic wand, right? So is small group educational groups, for example, or walking them through it. And I know that that's, that's really hard because you need to have the resources to do it. But what you need is essentially captive audience connection explanation. This is why those videos, to me, just don't do it because when you're not engaged in them, you're just kind of cycling through on fast forward and then you answer a little quiz at the end and that, that's it. Is anybody really learning something that they're going to remember two hours after? Whereas when you put them um, through these scenarios, and you've got a, a couple of students here that I, I <laughs> we've, we've talked a lot about this, right? Like people don't always remember what you tell them, but they remember how you made them feel. And if you can connect to that somehow in the way that you roll it out, and again, explaining it to them, here's the scenario and let's walk through and how to do it so that they can have compassion and empathy for what you're trying to do, they're going to remember it and bonus points, hopefully, they're not going to resent you asking them to do it. So why, you know, I mean, how many people complain when, oh, I have to change my password every six months, right? Like, you keep hearing this from everyone, from my mother and my peers to everybody. And it's like, and doesn't even matter, right? But if they, if, it, if they can understand why, 
Okay. Connect here. Yep. And then like also figure out how to connect it here. So I don't know what I don't know what the uh, industry or vertical you're in or what company you work for, but like whatever the executive team, whatever language they speak, whatever the things they care most about, like connect the program to that. And so I my company we had this notion of building a cyber risk balance. So we had a we took like these sort of fuzzy things that no one understands <coughs> about fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and we turned them into you've got X number of million dollars with a cyber risk on your couch. It's sitting there. What do you want to do about it? It's a lot. Like it's in the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So you should probably want to do something about it. If they speak that language, speak that language to them. And then every project, everything you're doing, every governance initiative, every control you want to buy, it's the best use of a marginal dollar. You're speaking that language, right? I can buy down ten million dollars worth of risk for a for a million dollar investment. I'm going to put a multi-factor authentication in front of the company, and we're going to put EDR on the domain. All of a sudden, who else has got an idea that's going to return better than 10 to 1 on a marginal dollar? Any, who's got a product that's going to do better than that? Maybe they do, and if they do, they should go spend it on it. But if they don't, then you've got to think of your security programs. It's, this is the best use of a marginal dollar to bind down this risk until it's not the best use of it. Then you've got a program to sort of achieve equilibrium, and it's about the right risk posture in the So it depends what language we speak. In the example I was giving, we spoke that language, right? We were VC funded, we spoke the language of investments, and marginal dollar of investment. So we tried to figure out how to anchor it to them. Know your audience, know their pain points, so to speak, but, but know how to guide them, right? You wouldn't leave just someone in the woods and just say, okay, turn left to the next stick, right? Like, you know, you, you go find yeah. them and walk them through it. And when you meet somebody where they're at, and then you connect the neurons they have to something new, that is a much easier bridge than it is to just here's the new information that they then have to learn, integrate, and you know, if you can connect it to their pre existing thought system, you're going to go a lot further. We got a couple of questions still, and I appreciate it so much. We, uh, we, we've we been given the hook, uh, and and that's, yeah, we, we have two minutes, Turkish. Oh, two minutes? Well, no, I mean, like, there's two minutes to switch out. Like, if you oh, can, okay. all right.